Hello everybody, I'm here with Bernd Musing and I'm here in Würzburg, Germany uh, in his company Argus and he makes bows and we're going to tell a bit about what makes a good bow important and what makes a good bow and also the innovation in bows in the last I think 15 years or something. Right, it's actually 20 years now or more than 20 years. Already. Okay. But um, yeah, first of all, welcome to Würzburg, um, home of very beautiful wines and mm -hmm. um, uh, beautiful landscape, of course, mm -hmm. and also mm -hmm. a, a city that's full of classical music, mm -hmm. uh, which we enjoy tremendously. Um, yeah, and, and home to um, mm -hmm. more most modern bow making in the okay. world. Um, so we consider ourselves a little bit of a capital here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Although Würzburg has, hasn't, hasn't been um, the, the, the center of violin making, mm -hmm. um, like Cremona or Mittenwald or other, mm -hmm. other places. Um, but we're changing this a little bit now. Okay. Uh, a lot of musicians come here every year and also makers and dealers um, from yeah. around the world to see how we are doing our babies, how we're making them. Mm -hmm. And um, what is behind it? And actually, there is a lot behind it, as many people have already found out. Um, it is a very special um, science and art and uh, craftsmanship. Um, and we, yeah, we just love supplying players with the most beautiful tools. Yeah, yeah, but just to go a little bit back to basics, yes. because uh, some people are watching and they're playing for maybe one, mm -hmm. two, three years, right. and they're thinking, okay, it's a stick with hair and I need mm -hmm. to get a nice violin, uh, but what makes the difference in both? Well, it's like like the breath for a singer. Mm -hmm. um, you can you can voice the nicest sounds if you don't have the breath to sing it out, um, you will only speak but not sing. And the same is true with the violin. Um, all the tone production, all the beauty of the sound comes mm -hmm. out of the right hand, um, mm -hmm. of the bow hand. Of course, the left, left hand has to hit the right notes, yeah. but um, only what the right hand does is then coming out as a beautiful sound. And the bow, uh, what the bow does, it mm -hmm. has two major implications. One is in the sound, and that is when the string vibrates, it can only vibrate as the bow vibrates mm -hmm. because they are just like almost glued together. Mm -hmm. um, you see, that's a big difference to the guitar where you pluck the string and then the string just vibrates freely. Yeah. That never or rarely happens on the violin. Most of the time the bow's on the string. Yeah. And the string can really only resonate and vibrate together with the bow. And that, that's why the bow has such a huge impact on the sound of the instrument. And number two, obviously, is uh, the playability. Mm -hmm. There's many things, many music where you have to bounce the bow, mm -hmm. or you have a staccato or um, ricochet where, where you throw the bow and it then bounces back. <clears throat> and all these um, Playability issues also play a much important role because if you have a bow that doesn't bounce properly, you just can't execute the music as it was desired from the composer. Yeah, so, so. you can add the sound colors uh, yeah. by uh, uh, yeah by having a good bow and Absolutely. of course bowing technique. Right. Uh, but the difference that you notice between different bows is in the handleability. If it helps you or if it stops you from. Uh, doing things or progressing. That's the next thing. So uh, um, there is no the be not not the best bow, uh, but but there's the best bow for every player. Your hand is not like mine hand, yeah. and and um, your way of moving your hand is different from mine. And yeah. we all have a different feel for for forces and for vibrations. So um, that is the next thing we always have to try to find the right bow for the right player yeah. and the right bow for the right instrument because again the the resonances of a bow and the violin should match yeah so it's a match between the three so the, the instrument mm -hmm. the player and the bow it must all work together come together and 
I would say it's about equal terms. Uh, uh -huh. Every one of these three components has the same importance. Uh, yeah. And you, if the violin doesn't work, you, you get no results. The bow doesn't work, you get no results. Yeah. I mean, the, if the player doesn't practice, then, you know, again, the same problem. <laughs> 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 so you have to get it all together. Yeah. Um, what a good bow does, even for a player who's, who's still learning, is mm -hmm. it guides you. Mm -hmm. It shows you the way. Yeah. It shows you how you should do your balances and your bowings and your detaché. And it also guides you in, in the sound of the violin. So a good bow will always give you a good feedback that helps you learn faster. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, also important to notice that uh, people shouldn't play with uh, a very crappy stick oh, yeah. uh, and think, well, I'm going to get a better bow when I'm better, but you're not going to get better if you don't have a good bow. So that, that's the, you know, the three things that are... Uh, Absolutely. Well, this is one of the common things we can see in the careers of some famous players. Um, when you read those, uh, when, when, you, when you learn about these people um, from reading their autobiography, for example, mm -hmm. every time you see that they were, they were getting a very, very good instrument at very young ages. Yeah. And very good teachers too, but they yeah. all had very nice instruments to learn on and very good bows, of course. Yeah. And um, nobody becomes a great player with a crappy instrument and with a crappy bow. It just doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's and what I notice with uh, selling instruments and bows is that if I play on an instrument and one is warm sounding and mm -hmm. another is uh, you know bright sounding or whatever, right. then if I play it to some someone else, it sounds different, but still the warm one is the warm one and the bright one is the bright one. Absolutely. And yeah. uh, but with bows, it's a lot more personal, I think, because you can't pick a bow for some someone else at all. Right. Um, right. It's like with shoes or with a pair of glasses. Mm -hmm. um, it's highly individual. And um, my only advice is to try as many good bows as you possibly can yeah. to find the one that suits you. Mm -hmm. It's also the reason why we do not only make one series mm -hmm. of bows or one range of bows, but we make the same bow with octagonal or round shapes, or we make them a little heavier or a little softer. Um, so a, mm -hmm. quite a bit of a right variation uh, to be able to find the right bow for everybody. Yeah. Um, you, there is not the one bow that does it for everybody. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there's one big danger that's, that we see happen sometimes between teachers and students. That the teacher has made an experience that this and this bow or string or instrument yeah. will work fine for him or her and then he or she tells all the students they should play with the same string, with the same kind of yeah. bow, the same kind of instrument, and but that doesn't necessarily make the players happy um, yeah. because it doesn't suit their style and they mm. wish how they want to sound. So uh, it's it's more favorable actually that that um, every player who's looking for an instrument and a bow gets some good advice and help mm -hmm. from people who know a lot about instrument and bows, but the final decision yeah. should always be with the player itself. And yeah. you should just listen to your feelings, how you, how you really feel well. And so if you, uh, for example, look at the bow hold of uh, famous players, Mm -hmm. um, you see they all develop their very individual style. What I find, for example, very fascinating is the funny bold hold of Yasha Heifetz. Mm -hmm. He puts his fingers like a paw. Yeah. And uh, I could never play like that. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. he, you see him doing the craziest stuff with this kind of bow hold, which yeah. I find completely amazing. And other players, you see, do like this. So completely yeah. different bow hold and everything in between. My bow hold is somewhere in between there. And so there, as there is no right or wrong bow hold, mm -hmm. there, um, there is no right or wrong bow. Yeah. Because every bow responds differently to uh, different bow holds. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. um, and also different bowing motions. A lot absolutely. of people do a lot of motion and some people right. don't, almost don't do it. Yeah. Um, and some have a heavier arm or a longer one, others are shorter and, and stronger, whatever. And everything changes a little bit the way the bow reacts mm -hmm. uh, and, and you actuate the bow. 
Um, that's why you really have to, to um, find your own bow. But on the other hand, of course, there's also some um, factors that are like our um, standards or like, like the, the frame and, and the physical rules around yeah. which, which we have to work. And that is, for example, the strings. Mm -hmm. If you look at the tension of modern strings, they are almost exactly the same. Yeah, it doesn't we, matter if you play a Tomastic or Pirastro or Dadario or whatever string, mm -hmm. they're almost exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. the resulting forces that you apply to these strings is also almost identical. Yeah. And that are the factors which we use to design a bow or construct a bow around, uh, which we do in a, in a more scientific way than, than traditional bow making, which works a little more like trial and error. Mm -hmm. We actually design our bows to work on these modern strings precisely. Yeah, and with modern strings, you mean the strings that we are using for the last 50 years, I think. Uh, because it's, I think, important to notice that in uh, the 19th century, everyone was playing in gut strings. Absolutely, yeah. and well away into the 20th century. Yeah. Pure gut strings, meaning no windings yeah. and no steel strings like we have on a violin E string for example that wasn't available yeah and um, and those strings uh, are obviously a lot lighter and a lot softer yeah. and wooden bows were actually designed to match these strings not modern high tension strings which are aluminum silver mm. gold wound yeah. steel strings um, which which allowed to be played with much higher forces and which we require much higher forces to be played with the bow yeah, because the design of the current bow, the wooden bow, and most carbon bows is actually the design from Tourte. The 19th century, right. Yeah. 1800 or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. true. And what do you do differently? Well, pretty much everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, actually, that was a starting point. Um, I was an amateur a player and an engineer, and um, I was shopping for a bow. And I was looking to find a bow that would not bottom out when I would play fortissimo or double mm -hmm. stops. And uh, it didn't matter how much money I was willing to spend, that bow was just not out there. Yeah. Not a carbon bow, not a wooden bow, it just didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So I sat down and tried to figure out what was wrong there what forces apply, what materials yeah. could be used, and came to the conclusion that we needed a completely new bow. Yeah, because the violin itself has changed a lot yes. in the past 200 years, yes. but the actually the bow didn't. Right. And strings have changed, and the whole setup. Exactly. And so I found out that we actually, actually need a bow that's almost twice as strong than a wooden bow. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that, not with aluminum, not with titanium, not with any other material, except you go for carbon fiber with, and that's the next big thing, with a very low epoxy content. Mm -hmm. A carbon fiber bow uh, consists not only from carbon fibers, but from something that holds them together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we have no epoxy, fibers would be like, like any other cloth. It would yeah. be soft. Yeah. So it would be completely noodle, noodly here, like a soft noodle, like a cooked noodle, right? Yeah. So it, it gets stiff only because the epoxy holds the fibers in place. Yeah. And the tricky bit starts exactly there. Um, to reduce or to have uh, to make a stick with as low an epoxy content as any possible, yeah. because the plastic sounds like boom, it's there, yeah. and the carbon and fibers is resonant like glass. Bing. And I think yeah. that's the uh, what you mentioned about the plastic, right? Uh, is what people notice with very cheap carbon bows or yes. carbon composite bows. Yes. That because they actually consist more from epoxy, from uh -huh. resin, than from fibers. Yeah. There's uh, so way too much epoxy in it. It's, that's easy to make. It's quick and cheap, uh -huh. um, easy to make. Um, but every percent of epoxy you try to get out of the stick makes things more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the difference between, uh, let's say, a thousand dollar carbon bow and uh, 50 or 50 or, 100 yeah, or exactly. whatever yeah. yeah yeah i mean you also find many other details that are very different mm -hmm. 
um, only the the hair that we put on our bows would be worth a hundred euros roughly. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's it, but on the the use of that is that with our hair, a, a professional player can like play two years, um, five, six, seven, eight hours a day, and the hair wow. is still good. Yeah. If you have a cheap hair on a cheap bow, it'll last a couple of weeks, yeah. and, and, and they're gone. Yeah. So it's the difference in the hair quality really um, makes a huge difference, and it's similar to, um, like, for example, wooden violins. Yeah. You have two wooden violins. One is a Stradivari. Yeah. With a beautiful sound, which costs a fortune. And the other one is just a cheap factory yeah. fiddle that sounds terrible. Yeah, it's both wood. It's both both wood and both the and same kind of wood, and they look yeah. very similar, but they are not at all. Yeah. And the absolute same true is is is, is true with wood with bows and with hairs and all these things. All the details yeah. that add up. Yeah. Yeah. So one car is one car is made from steel, and that that's just a Fiat, and the other one is a Ferrari, and yeah. you wouldn't say it's the same thing. Yeah. And so if you look a little closer into both, you'll find um, subtle and huge differences uh, yeah. everywhere. Yeah, and I think the more you develop your bowing technique uh, and the more bows you try, the more you are going to discover those differences. Absolutely, yes. And uh, so it's absolutely worthwhile to invest a little bit of time to see what it does for you. Yeah, exactly. There are a lot of brands in uh, carbon fiber bows. Right. And a lot of them are still in the same design as Torte in 1800, actually. Right. Um, are there copycats of your bows? Or what makes a difference from, say, a brand like Coda Bow? Um, well, there's two things here. One is that most people who are involved in bow making are not engineers or, um, you know, they have no background in science or technology, whatever. Yeah. So all they do is pretty much copy what they see and just yeah. use different material. Yeah. And uh, funnily enough, they end up with a product that is not really what you would want. Mm -hmm. um, it looks similar, but it yeah. behaves funny and sounds a little weird, maybe. Uh -huh. um, so that's one issue. The other issue is they are making a high quality carbon fiber boat is actually a very demanding task. It's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. And um, although we're out on the market with our boats for um, 18 years now, already, mm -hmm. um, I've heard quite often that somebody's trying to make an Arcus bow copy, yeah. and, uh, but it never came uh, to it. I've, okay. I've never seen one. Yeah. Um, and I have a pretty good idea why that is. Yeah. And it's it's really, really not so easy. Um, okay. Everybody's invited to do it. I would actually even maybe, you know, if you're going <laughs> to try and make some make some high-end carbon fiber bows, I might yeah. give away some secrets. Uh, I might not tell everybody everything. Um, but I would actually love to see a little more competition yeah. in this part of the market. But um, yeah, the market is, is very traditional, so they don't really experiment in a scientific way, perhaps. Well, because that's craftsmen. I mean, yeah. in, um, all the bow makers, they have learned to make wooden bows. Yeah, and in they're not engineers, they're not designers. Yeah. And they're not scientists. They don't know why the bow works as it does. Yeah. And they don't have a background in designing a new bow. And... Um, so that really makes makes a big big difference uh, to what we are doing here. Um, uh, we start with uh, research and developing a product. We we design actually we calculate everything on the bow. Mm -hmm. So nothing is by chance here or by just yeah. try and error. This is not what we do at all. Yeah. <clears throat> and but to get to this point, um, you need a very different uh, education to begin with. Yeah. Um, so a learned ball maker will not be able to make a carbon fiber bow. Yeah, it's a totally different Profession. craft. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is, yes. Yeah. So also our team in the workshop, there is not a single learned ball maker in it. Yeah. It's goldsmith, it's dental technicians, it's all kinds of people from different professions who know how to handle difficult materials uh -huh. and, yeah. and um, small things with utmost precision. 
And then they learn here um, all the special trait about handling carbon fibers and doing the hair and the leather and the silver and gold stuff and all that. Yeah. So every single worker who's in our workshop, we have trained for many years. From so your own research and development in the past. Exactly. And yes. in the present, perhaps, also. Right. And every, of course, also every maker who enters our team brings in their own experience. Yeah. Uh, say, as a dental technician or yeah. as a goldsmith. <laughs> Yeah. And add some to the to the pool of experience, and so that we we work we constantly keep developing our quality and and our manufacturing processes, but still it, it remains a very difficult and time consuming task to make these bows. That's yeah. not changing at all. <laughs> and f uh, for for the players watching, if you uh, play with an Arcus for the first time, right, what will you notice that's different? Because it's made in a different way with a different material. And yeah, players think, oh, that's that's all well. <laughs> but what do you actually notice when I have one in my hands? Of course, the best way to find out is to actually have one in your hands, but perhaps you can describe it. Actually, for me, it's a little difficult now because I'm so used to the bows. But yeah. what I what I see in other players when they try them the first time is that they're a little shaken because the technique they would normally apply mm -hmm. with a wooden bow all of a sudden has changed. Mm -hmm. So yeah. something is something is different. Let me try to illustrate it that with a little, little an example. If you've been driving cars all your life, but all of a sudden you sit in a Ferrari or in a Porsche in a sports car, and you've never had driven a sports car before, yeah. that's the same thing. Everything's too direct and wow. And you really have to find your way through the first curves. And so, yeah. so it's really different. And it's not better or worse initially, uh -huh. but it's really different. So you yeah. have to feel your way into it. The and response is very different. Yeah. The response is, I think, uh, from my own experience, far more direct. Exactly. Uh, so the first couple of weeks, you actually have to learn to do less. Thing, to do less, right. actually, right. because everything <coughs> is uh, easier, but also right. smaller. Yeah. Uh, just as in a sports car, that uh, if you're used to a Fiat 500 or right, something, right. and you are used to, if you go for grocery shopping, you just hit the gas full, you right. don't have to do that with the Ferrari. Exactly. <laughs> like, very, very, very direct uh, comparison. If you steer, if you if you look at the steering wheel, mm -hmm. to, to turn a corner in a, 500, a Fiat 500, you have to turn your, te your wheel like twice around or what. Yeah. And in a Ferrari, <laughs> you do just this. Yeah. So it's a, it's a much, the, and, and you, you're around the corner, so you do much less. And that's the yeah. same too with our Arcus bows, because um, they're so much stiffer mm -hmm. that that you normally do too much initially, yeah. uh, where you just move very little and you get the same result. So you can make your bone technique more subtle, actually. Yeah. And then also make it more refined in learning that, learning to handle it. Right. You also get a very direct feedback. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the things that might surprise you in the beginning, um, that it is not like working in a big soft pillow and a cushion, yeah. uh, but bang, you, you instantly hit something firm. Yeah. And, and you get a very direct feedback on all your actions, both in the sound and in the play. Yeah. And that is... That is a little weird in the beginning, mm -hmm. but once you get used to it, you go back to your wooden bow and it really feels sluggish and slow and unresponsive yeah. and heavy. Yeah, and you have to do all kinds of, you know, you hear people always have to develop all kinds of tricks and right. stuff to, to get the bow to do what they want. So they yeah. have to, uh, it, the bow doesn't do directly what they want. So they have to find all kinds of ways, workarounds, exactly. workarounds and stuff to get used to that bow. And, and that's exactly what you find, for example, in professional players when they first play with an Arcus bow. They have to stop all that extra work. Yeah. They have to to just lose their workarounds. They yeah. don't need them anymore. Yeah. And Actually, if they're in the way. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't need the tricks and the workarounds and stuff. Right. And the extra work, then 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 you can get to develop. I think the, to a higher level. Yeah, absolutely. Or you can just play more comfortable, uh, faster if you want, yeah. um, stronger if you like. Um, so actually the, the window of opportunity is just quite a bit larger. Mm -hmm. You can play more silent or louder. You can play slower with, a, with an extremely calm bow because it just doesn't shake. Yeah. Or you can, you can play faster and it, you still feel safe. 
Yeah. So actually the window of all you can do on the instrument is enlarged. Yeah, yeah, because the bow is almost never out of control. Yeah. As yeah. wooden bows sometimes get wobbly and out right. of control, or you yeah. uh, press into it and it doesn't respond, that kind of yeah. stuff. Exactly. Uh, you don't, uh, you don't get that. Mm -hmm. um, then how how long does it take people to get used to this? So one funny story was like uh, there was a soloist who played the Marcus bow for the first time mm -hmm. in, in her life in the morning, and she played a full concert in, in the evening wow. of a bow because she was so happy about it. Wow, it's tricky. <laughs> um, yeah, right. For her, it was the perfect solution. She was yeah. playing a modern work that was really difficult. Okay. And it was hard to get all the fast piccatos right. Yeah. And then with the Arcus bows, it went like pearls on the string. Okay. And uh, so why, that's why she decided to instantly go for it. Yeah. And there's other occasions where like half a year after a player purchased a bow, uh, he calls me and tells me, look, last week I found out how to do this and that. So for some players, it takes really a long time to discover all the possibilities on the bows. Yeah. The normal case is that it takes about a week to really understand most of what our bows mm -hmm. do. Yeah. And then there's a long time where you discover all the stuff you've never thought possible yeah. on a violin that you can actually do with an orchestra bow. Yeah. So the new stuff. The new things. Yeah. And that can be a very interesting discovery yeah. for many players. Yeah. 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 yeah, you can discover still keep discovering things in a yeah. in a bow. Right. Um and what I was wondering, we already talked about that the market is quite con conservative in th in new things. And um uh, some teachers say that okay, uh, carbon bows don't have character. Uh but I would say uh, exactly the opposite is True, because you have a lot more character and response from an Arcus bow. What, what do you say about uh, this? Because some people, some teachers think, well, a carbon bow is a carbon bow. But as we said at the beginning of the interview, uh, there are many differences in carbon bows. I completely understand the reaction of many teachers or many people, you know, who've seen 10 or 20 different carbon fiber bows and yeah. they all looked a little different or came with different brands yeah but they were all of the same mediocre quality and yeah. and all their sound and playability was okay maybe yeah. or mediocre and then when they run into name number 21 which happens to be arcus for example then yeah. they already know okay carbon bows is something really boring or not yeah. some very good quality and then they're not really prepared for this completely new um, adventure uh, that, that is coming towards them. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one of the things I, I experience so often when we are at exhibitions or at shows uh, or at ESTA meetings, whatever, yeah. where people who already know everything about carbon fiber yeah. um, suddenly discover Arcus bows and then uh, see, oh, wait a minute, this is a very, very different animal. Yeah, it's completely um, different. Yeah, and but then there they, are, of course, uh, so many brands of kind of similar carbon fiber yeah, bows. Right. Uh, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. eBay, and they have different right. colors and different uh, th frogs, perhaps, yeah. and uh, they look very different, but it's uh, a lot of them are actually the same and even from the same factory right. in China somewhere. Yeah, yeah. That, that is true. There's a big factory cranking out these these sticks uh, and yeah. the high volume they're all very low quality and all made pretty much in the same way uh, you find them at all different price points and all different brands and, and different colors as you said but really the, the the core of it is that they don't differ too much yeah and um, it, again it's it's like a, a cheap Chinese uh, wooden factory fiddle um, it you can search as long as you want you will never find a strong variety with them yeah and the same is true with the cheap carbon bows there are no really high-end bows in there yeah some are decent um, mm -hmm. you know they also run uh, run a bit of luck here and there mm -hmm. um, but what we do is a completely different story we are we're heading for a totally different level of performance mm -hmm. beyond what uh, wooden bows can offer yeah. and, and that's our daily business and um, as the state is now you'll find no orchestra in Germany where not a handful of players are, are happily playing their orchestra bows yeah. and don't go back to wood yeah actually yeah. not I would say 95% of all people who own an orchestra bow play that bow only yeah 
And because yeah. every wooden bow in comparison looks clumsy or doesn't yeah. deliver the sound or it's just less comfortable to play or too yeah. slow. And um, so once you, you get, you find your Arcus bow, you're usually lost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or found. It's, or it's just found. the way you want to right, say it. Right. Um, I've got on my uh, YouTube channel uh, viewers from all over the world. If mm -hmm. people want to try out Arcus, uh, of course, in Holland they can go to me, but um, can yeah, you tell a bit how you sell them? Where can people try them, buy them? How, yeah. uh, there are hundreds of dealers around the world who stock our bows, and you can find uh, a long list of those on our website yeah. uh, in the dealer um, section. And if you don't find a dealer around uh, your place, then just contact us and we'll yeah. give you directions or maybe even be able to um, or, or arrange a trial shipment of bowls from you, from wherever you are. Okay, Great. It should work around the world. Yeah, I'll put in the link below this video. <laughs> All right, are there uh, other things you want to mention about bows in general or uh, Arcus bows? Well, there's one thing I want to say is um, that um, we are really dedicated in making the, the finest bows and the perfect tool for every player. If you have a chance to try Arcus bows and find that something's missing and you're missing a certain type of bow or a certain quality, please let me know. Uh, we really do everything to make everybody really happy. Great. All right, I think that's a great ending of the interview. Thank you very much Thank for you, all this valuable information. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, thanks for watching.